Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and we are continuing our multi-part series highlighting Polish organizations helping Ukrainian refugees and the displaced. Today, we are speaking with the Culture Lab Foundation and the vital work they are doing for those affected by the war in Ukraine with special guest, Monica Miloska, who is the co-founder of, Culture, of the Culture Lab Foundation, and, and where are you located right now in Poland? I'm in Warsaw, in capital city. In Warsaw. So tell us a little bit about the situation that is on the ground in Poland, and then talk about how you founded um, uh, and, 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 your, and your colleagues founded this organization in response. Well, as you all know, like um, currently more in fact than 6 million of refugees flew to Poland and from just from the first day or second day of the war, uh, suddenly thousands of refugees were moving to Poland, which caused in fact an amazing uh, movement of all the people, of the volunteers, of non-governmental organizations, of municipalities that had to react just from one day to another to be able to support uh, children and mothers coming to Poland. And in fact, I'm just one of many, really many of non-governmental organizations from Poland that decided just on the second day of the war, okay, we do all our best to support uh, children, to help them and to figure out how to use our capacities in a best way to support as many as, uh, as possible. It's really astounding what happened because, as you said, six six million or more have been displaced, internally displaced, and moved over uh, over the border. And there are some millions of people who are now um, in Poland uh, seeking to move further west. There's a whole logistics uh, challenge to that. But then you also have children who need to go to school, who need um, uh, and their parents who need just basic necessities, food and shelter and so on. Um, you are um, coordinating a civil society response, aren't you? This is not a government organization, is it? <laughs> no, I'm not a government organization. I'm the non nonprofit organization. I'm not sure if I can say that I coordinate all the humanitarian aid work, but I try through my organization to map all small and big organizations that run diverse activities in Poland, whether they support the food aid, the shelter aid, or educational, or any other kind of the aid that is run, then I, we try to map it and show an map and show it as well to refugees, as to local municipalities, but also to bigger international uh, non-governmental organizations so that they would know where and how and what they can do to support uh, civil society in Poland. And this is a, uh, particularly in the early days, it was a completely disorganized human response, wasn't it? It was just a lot of individuals just seeing people flooding over, sometimes getting in their passenger cars to figure out how to transport some families, opening their homes. It was it was a very um, emotional kind of kind of response of uh, to to human needs. When you see your neighbor suffering, you reach out, and that was essentially what happened. But over time, it started to be organizing. Could you describe those early days and where the situation is today? Well, it has changed a little bit, but also it has changed because, uh, not because of the time, but also the number of refugees that are currently coming to Poland. Indeed, at the beginning of the war, everything was like a chaos. Like, I'm almost sure that no matter what you do, each action is, is um, important, but also plenty of people were coming to a certain point like giving food, and then suddenly some organizations were saying, okay, come on, we even don't have enough space for that in our magazines. Go 50 kilometers further, there are still plenty of refugees and there's lack of, uh, lack of uh, such a support. To be honest, like I think that more than 50% of my friends, they took the families to their own homes or to extra apartments that they had and uh, decided to do it from a day to a day. 
uh, firstly for one month, then they postponed it, not postponed it, but they uh, agreed for staying those people for two or three months. And right now, well, not right now, maybe the situation of refugees might be changed because plenty of people right now say like, okay, unfortunately by myself, I'm not able to, for instance, to help a certain family for longer than six months in my own home, in my own uh, room. So that's one thing. Second thing is that at the beginning, all the volunteer work was really huge calls. Like everybody, it's just as you said, my friends were moving to the border and taking people here to the Warsaw. They were searching for another organization all over the Europe to support refugees to find a good place all over the Europe. But then people started being more scared that if uh, if their volunteers will not be somehow registered, then there is a big possibility, for instance, for illegal um transport or um, unlegal selling of people. So that was one of the things that our government tried to do is to create a registration form for all the volunteers. So if you go to Medica or to the border, uh, then you need to have your yellow uh, shirt, you need to sign, you need to give your name and surname, and then you can be a volunteer. That's what has changed during first two weeks or three weeks. But to be honest, still until now, most of the activities that are done in Poland and most of the support are run whether by private people, by non-government organizations or by municipalities. Um, Still, there is not sufficient support from our government. It's not that it doesn't exist, but it could be much bigger. Well, I think I think you're pointing out a number of different factors, right? When something happens, people who have some um, resources set aside, maybe it's an apartment that they don't use all the time or space in their apartment, or maybe they have a little bit of extra money, they have a little bit of extra time, right? So they dedicate that to help others, but then all that is absorbed. And at a certain point, people run out of resource. And when they run out of resource, they become a little bit less patient. So you have that transfer. And you're also um, you're also pointing out that this chaotic situation is a place where all sorts of things, good and bad, can happen. Right? The human trafficking uh, yes. uh, piece that you were pointing out, particularly of women, particularly of children. Right? So at a certain point, society has to step in governmental organizations have to step in and create some some logic to it. But as you said, a lot of it still has to do with, with nonprofit organizations. So what you've seen in Poland is a rapid development of the nonprofit sector, haven't you? Indeed. In fact, right now, what's the, the, the most difficult um, thing to do is that right now we have more, more and more resources but there is not enough of the people who could do the proper work. And also the non-government organizations are developing, but there is a certain point that they are not able to develop because of the space they have, because of the people they are able to uh, to find, et cetera. (laughs) Right, because if you're going to be doing this for a, a large portion of time, somehow those people have to be paid. How does that, how is that working? Because Poland can't absorb all this um, by by yourself. Are you getting, are you seeing other support from not only uh, Poland, but also from outside of Poland? Yes, of course. To be honest, right now, one of the biggest support that is given to, um, to refugees in Poland are through UNICEF, UNHCR, uh, WHO, uh, and also to be honest, plenty of American in, uh, international government, uh, non-government organizations. And in fact, like, uh, well, you are all from United States, probably you know the Mercy Corps and America, uh, America Care. Those were two first organizations that show up in Poland on the, I think, fourth day of a war. And they said like, okay, if there is any non-government organization that needs help, just write us 
and half a page of description and will try to support us. That was the best thing that could happen for non-government organizations. There were other uh, activities run by United, uh, European Union, by our government, but up to now, none of those institutions didn't pay anything to, no, uh, to non-government organizations. So we are still waiting, but you know, the three months has passed and so plenty of work was done. So um, without a broad support, probably it would be much more difficult uh, to, to run or to do in Poland. You know, it's interesting. We disrespect our the international organizations that we ourselves set up. NATO was coming under some disrespect until now we need NATO. The WHO has come under some disrespect. Uh, UNHCR, UN, the UN, UNICEF, and so on, has been seen as a dysfunctional uh, money pit that, that gets nothing done until we actually need some of the structures that, that were built. How in Poland do people see these international organizations? Do they uh, value them? And then, and then, there are limits. So there are these uh, nonprofit organizations that are coming up. Are you finding that you are developing a um, nonprofit ecosystem to deal with where the needs are, where there might be gaps that are left by these very massive bureaucracies that have good intent, but sometimes are not particularly responsive? Are you finding that the local organizations are filling those gaps? Um, okay, answering the first question, I think Polish people do appreciate UN organization. I know that in Western Europe, it doesn't look like that. I know that in America, also not really, <laughs> or okay, not everywhere, but in some of the, between some of the societies. In Poland, probably because we still remember, or rather grand, our grandmothers, or maybe older mothers, still remember what was happening after the Second World War and that then the UNICEF, UNHCR, were supporting Polish people, were in fact giving food. Through that, still UNICEF and UNHCR has really, um, is well seen, is respected as an organization. But I am, yes, has a good reputation. But to be honest, I'm not quite sure if a common citizen of Poland knows right now how much UNICEF is help, helps. I mean, I know because I participate in every week meeting where as well as small organizations as big one uh, are meeting with each other, exchanging knowledge, they network. Through that, I know where and how the funds are going. Uh, but I'm not sure if the uh, current society knows. That's one that's responding for the one first question. And the second, it is true that big organizations or big international organizations, they sometimes want and needs wish to see numbers. They want to report how many people they've served. And through that, it's much easier to run a project in a bigger uh, cities like Warsaw, Wrocław, Krakow, because immediately you reach thousands of children. And in fact, that's the aim of my organization that maps all those small organizations to see where are gaps, where the funds should, still should go, uh, where people who are in need and still they lack um, the support. So probably in that way, without smaller non-governmental organizations, without civil society that is present all over the Poland, it, uh, the proper way of the help would not be possible. You know, you're making a very good point. Very often in this country, these organizations are dismissed because they talk. They talk a lot. They communicate, they meet. But maybe that idea of talking does a number of things that are really important for civil society. First of all, while you're talking, you're not waging war. <laughs> and then also, communication allows you to organize rationally. So by exchanging information, by sharing, by convening and exchanging information, it allows people to act in a way that is rational because you are informing your colleagues, your colleagues are informing you about where the needs are. And then you can orchestrate a supply 
that it, that meets the needs of the moment. Is that that's part of what you're doing, isn't it? Is to take knowledge that might be accumulating in some corner of Poland about the situation there and bringing it to a group and then deciding how to respond. It's it, it's probably a much more organized description than it works on the ground, but isn't that part of your job? It is indeed. Like I will say you the anecdote when for the first those first two weeks, most of our my friends were even, I know, making making a selfie that they are, I know, making a sandwiches for the for people or they going by by car. The only selfie I could do was sitting in front of a computer and I and talking and exchanging information, writing emails. But the, the idea of my work was to, you know, reach, no, not reached, and without time, you will not be able to, uh, to do that. Like for the, for instance, for the first one month, we've managed to find only 100 institutions that were, re- that were supporting Poland. Right now, we've got more than 800 of them all over the Poland, but it needs uh, time. It's just the same way the UNHCR is working. At the beginning, Polish, gover- Polish non-governmental organizations were claiming like, oh, why do they ask so many questions? Why do we need to fill in all those tables? Like, oh, come on, they ask how many people we serve, where, what, why, etc. It takes so much time. But based on that, they could also map the most basic needs and knew where and how to send funds. So of course, time is needed. And, uh, and talks are needed in, also in such a situation as humanitarian aid. Well, let's talk about the needs that you have identified. So there are needs of people of different ages. The very young have certain needs. The very old have certain other needs. And then people who are in the middle, they need jobs. They need, they need to figure out how to make an income. So um, how do these, these needs sort in terms of human health, education, jobs, and then basic needs of, of, of people, and how have those needs evolved? I will maybe answer in a bit different way. Like few two weeks ago, uh, there was a huge meeting, meeting of where took part more than 120 of experts. There were as well representatives of municipalities, non-government organizations, experts, uh, trade unions, Altogether, we were working within eight topics, just as you said, shelter, work, education, medicine, health, um, and other topics. And uh, within those things, we were, within those eight topics, we were trying to create the the recommendation for legal changes um, that would support or help people to feel better or to um, not, not to feel better, to allow them to live in Poland in a proper way, let's say. And uh, there is just to said, there are different um, needs in education. You've got, okay, first of all, we've, you've got right now in Poland, 1 million people who are registered, who obtain their PESEL, which means that by our law, they are able to obtain uh, financial support, they can to go to school, they can take work. But it's only one million. We know that there live in Poland two million and a half. So within this two million and a half, we've got only 100,000 or only 100,000 uh, registered children that should go to school, but only 30% of them are going, in fact, to schools or were t- going to school within for the last uh, three months. What about others? What to do with them in uh, September? Uh, whether some of them will go back to Ukraine, whether they will stay, should they stay with, within the Polish means within Polish uh, curriculum or Ukrainian curriculum, how to support them. There are so many diverse issues that you have to solve. As far as the mental as mental health is concerned, how to support mental health of those children if our psychologist speaks only uh, Polish, not Ukrainian. So in fact, you should create the 
um, the duet of an Ukrainian speaking and Polish speaking. But for that, you have to change a law. What about uh, like a shelter, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. There are plenty of uh, issues that have to be solved. But good, I, good, good thing is that currently, I suppose that uh, most of the uh, the recommendations were already done. It's just how will we implement them? Will we manage to implement them? And if we'll have enough knowledge uh, where to find those refugees who really need whether shelter, psychological help or educational help. Well, and, and it would be the equivalent if the United States absorbed 20 million people who spoke a different language um, within a very short period of time, right? It is a huge, huge stress. As you say, you have to change the laws, even in your example, surrounding education and what can be taught. And then there are the language issues and there are the practical issues of where do you uh, create space for such classrooms, right? And then of course the trauma uh, on top of it. Um, are you finding that people in Poland are re retaining a positive attitude or is there a, a shift? There's a worry, of course, that people under stress will end up having a negative attitude and, and you start having um, negativity in fact um, the attitude of, of the neighbors uh, that are absorbing these displaced individuals? Or do you find that the memories of your grandparents of having been invaded and having been partitioned and um, having um, during the Second World War and the aftermath, the Germans and the Russians basically um, uh, arguing over, over Polish territory, is that memory so powerful that people are seeing this struggle as their struggle as well. How, how, how are the attitudes developing in Poland? Um, everybody worry how the attitudes will change in a short time. Up to now, it okay, for the first two months, it was really almost only positive attitudes. Right. I could not hear from any side, whether left or right, anything negative. Right now, it is changing a little bit, but it's almost also changed a little, just a little bit. But mostly when we see and research who is write, writing something negative, those are trolls from Russia, not really certain people. Um, but I will tell you what, what happened at the beginning. You probably know that, um, that in our border, there was a crisis also at, at the Belarus border, where plenty of migrants were coming from diverse countries, not from Ukraine, trying to cross our border. And uh, our government did not let to do that. And uh, for those migrants, there were extremely negative attitudes all over the Poland. But what happened on the second day of the war, then suddenly the same people who had extremely negative attitudes for the migrants from Africa, from Asia, suddenly they show up on the Ukrainian border asking like, okay, how can we help? We are from, I don't know, the, we are true Polish people and we will support our, our neighbors. And up to now, they still do like that. Uh, it's rather, you know, most of the municipalities are right now, they try to solve the problem, how to support Ukrainian children, but also not forgetting about poor Polish people. So that those, the poorest families wouldn't say like, hey, come on, why do we have wars in our own country than the neighbors that came for, uh, to us or the refugees? Uh, and that will be the challenge also because Many of international non-governmental organizations cannot or do not want to pass the funds also for those poor Polish people who could come to the same, uh, well, you know, integration group as Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. um, but we will see. I hope we will manage uh, to uh, to keep on positive or at least neutral attitudes. But you know, also there's a third thing what which I should say was that for many years there were plenty of Ukrainians that were coming to Poland just as a normal labor work. And uh, usually they were learning Polish very fast, 
they were working hard. There were anyway positive attitudes toward it, towards them. Right now, probably also people know and see that most of the women are trying to find a work as soon as possible. Uh, even taking a work below their, I know, by, below their uh, educational level. And that is somehow um, um, seen well by a Polish society in a way. So as we move forward, one of the tactics that Russia is employing is this idea of being more patient than Western countries being more patient than Poland, being more patient than all of Europe, being more patient than the United States, and stretching things out until the, um, the cohesion that Poland, the Polish society is, is, is showing today, that that falls apart. That the Europe, um, which is just embargoed um, Russian oil, that that falls apart, that American um, uh, uh, support of uh, Ukraine, that falls apart. Do you feel that that the West, democracy, civil society in, in these areas is going to sustain the their attention? Because in a place where uh, things are more autocratic, um, you don't have to worry about what your citizens uh, think so much, particularly if you control the media Whereas if you have a lot of chatter and you have a lot of uh, discussion and difference, um, you can end up having debate overtake um, any kind of consensus. How do you see this developing in Poland? And, and what are you doing in your organization to maintain the energy towards support of these Ukrainian refugees? Um, you asked a difficult question. Uh, because on one hand, there is something like that in the Polish society that because we remember Second World War and because, especially during the last few years when we've got a more right-based uh, government and the, um, the history the, um, of Second World War um, showing our glory, showing but also showing in Russia as our uh, enemy, was underlined much more than it was even eight years ago. I suppose that because of that, uh, I rather than think that uh, mm, our will to support Ukraine will disappear fast. You can easily even see, well, anyway, because, just because of that. As far as the society co is concerned, I might think that in a short time, People will rather concentrate on how to cope with Ukrainians that already flee here and just normally live with them. Then they will concentrate on how to support Ukrainian to really uh, win the war. But maybe I'm wrong. I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm the best expert to answer this, uh, this uh, question. I think we all have to discuss the, these kinds of issues. I, I think that, that democracy needs to, uh, uh, and, and all of us are part of democracy, we need to all decide what we will accept and what kind of behaviors are, um, are worthy of emulation. I think in ourselves, we have to find the discipline to create the society that we want to create. And if we just accept uh, these warlike behaviors, and that's the world we're going to get, because if we reward those with a little bit of patience, an autocrat can basically impose their will upon us as we all fall apart. I think that the work that you're doing and the work that your people are doing are so much part of a solution. I'd like to uh, to thank you, uh, Monica Miłowska, co-founder of Culture Lab Foundation, for sharing some of your experiences and your insights with us. It's so very valuable. And thank you so much for your for your services, both to the Polish people and to the Ukrainian refugees who are being hosted by Poland. You, you're doing wonderful work. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm just one of many in, in Poland, but thanks for this time. <laughs> thank you. Take care.